Okay, welcome everybody. I hope this finds everybody in good form and high spirits. So we at NUPI have a great have the great pleasure to virtually welcome um, Associate Professor Matt McDonald to talk about his new book, Ecological Security, Climate Change and the Construction of Security, which was published this month with Cambridge University with Cam Cambridge University Press. Uh, without spoiling the surprise, the book could scarcely be more timely, especially in the Norwegian context. Indeed, following the recent IPCC report, the Norwegian election has been characterised by questions of who has what duty to address climate change and when. Meanwhile, following last night's result, the centre and left parties are about to enter into negotiations um, with, with, uh, with each other, uh, and they disagree profoundly uh, on whether, when and how Norway should cease the production of oil. These are all questions that Matt book, Matt's book speaks to, among many others. Um, for those of you who are not already familiar with Matt, uh, he is an associate yeah. professor at the University of Queensland. And for more than a decade, Matt has been at the forefront of IR critical scholarship in international relations and critical climate security scholarship in particular. He's the author uh, or co-author of several books. And meanwhile, he has been, his work has been published in several leading IR journals, the European Journal of International Relations, Political Geography, Review of International Studies, among many others. Um, this book builds upon Matt's prior research, but goes considerably further. Um, okay, having read uh, the book, I don't want to give too much away. I will now give the floor to Matt. Uh, I think we said bet between 20 to 30 minutes for your talk and about 30 more for Q&A. So for those listening at home, you'll be able to ask questions um, through the chat function. So please make use of that. Okay, Matt, um, take it away. Thank you so much for that, for that Paul, introduction, uh, Paul. I really do appreciate it. And I, I'm seriously considering uh, managing to uh, have Paul as some sort of publicist, I think, if I can, uh, if I can manage it. Um, I've managed to, hang on, I will just start my presentation. So um, as Paul has flagged, it's wonderful, first of all, to, to be here. I really do appreciate the invitation, the opportunity to to join you all and obviously uh, lots of uh, I would love to have been in Oslo for this I do have to say um, but lots of uh, good colleagues friends uh, at NUPI um, who I've spent time with over the over the years and I say hello to them and to anyone who's joining for the first time um, hopefully you can see my slides okay at this point um, so the the presentation is really around this this book that's coming out in um, only about a week's time with uh, Cambridge that looks at the concept of ecological security. And really the um, idea behind the project is um, to give meaning to, to what, in a sentence, the book is really about the question of what the relationship between climate change and security would look like if that relationship was viewed through the lens of ecosystem resilience rather than necessarily the preservation or protection or insulation of currently existing uh, human collectives or institutions, which is quite quite a long sense, I realise as I'm, as I'm saying it. Um, so the context around this really is, of course, climate change is increasingly recognised as a security issue. We've seen a series of debates in the UN Security Council. The first of these was in 2007 and another one in 2011, but we've seen debates every year since 2018 with another one on the horizon um, in September um, by the Irish, uh, or put forward by the, um, the Irish uh, representatives. So, Lots of attention at the UN Security Council to this issue. We see it increasingly recognised in um, national security strategy documents. Shirley Scott's made the, made the case that actually it appears in um, over 70% of states that are releasing such documents identify climate change as a clear uh, threat to their national security. We see the establishment of the climate um, security mechanism that was established in 2018 by your uh, by your neighbours, uh, Sweden. We've seen ARIA formula debates, lots of debates about the potential role of climate change in terms of conflict, especially in the context, of course, of, of Darfur and then um, Syria. While contested, a lot of these things really do point to this broader context that actually we increasingly recognise that climate change constitutes a security issue, whereas warrant, it warrants us uh, considering it. 
as a potential threat to security. So there's lots of attention in academic circles, both analytically um, or focused on analytical questions, but also crucially, I think, focused on normative questions as well. On the former, on some of those analytical questions, um, the focus is often how exactly does climate change contribute to instability or conflict? At what level does it constitute a significant enough threat to constitute an international security challenge or problem, for example? On the latter, on the normative question, the focus is often whether uh, securitization is a good thing. Does presenting climate change as a security issue help mobilise particular responses to particular issues, for example, or does it speak to consi uh, particular constituencies? Um, at what level does it have effectiveness as a form of representation, or is it something that it's better for us to avoid altogether? Because as many of you who are deeply familiar with securitization theory would know, there's an argument here that presenting an issue as a security threat might usher in a series of illiberal responses that suspend normal democratic uh, politics, bring in uh, politics of exceptionalism, allow militaries to access funds and, and so on, those types, of, those types of arguments. The book in some ways begins from the premise that that's actually the question around whether it's a good thing to link climate change and security is actually the wrong question to be asking. What matters from my perspective, and this builds on some of the theoretical work that I've done in terms of security and the politics of security, what matters isn't whether climate change is viewed as a security issue, but really how security itself is defined and understood. Um, and the book and in some earlier work, I distinguish between discourses of climate security, frameworks of meaning that encourage us to view the security implications of climate change in particular ways. So I distinguish between discourses of security with different choices of referent object of whose security matters and point to how these encourage different sets of responses to uh, the problem of climate change itself. This is really important for me in terms of the rationale for the project as a whole, but also how I conceptualise this connection between climate change and security. Um, it helps in explain my engagement with security at all, um, because security, I make the case, is actually central to the political legitimacy of key actors. So there's a case to be made for engaging with it and assessing the normative and practical implications of different accounts of security itself. So the project builds in important ways on my account of theories of security, and that orients around this idea that security is constructed, political and ethical. It's constructed in the sense that security is ultimately given meaning in particular empirical contexts through dynamic processes. So over time, and by particular political communities in different ways. In other words, what security means shouldn't be reserve of analysts to basically decide, but rather political communities ultimately give meaning to how they define their core values that are in need of being preserved or advanced. Second, security is political in the sense that the promise of providing security is foundational to the legitimacy of key actors in the international system but the specific implications of approaching an issue as a security issue will vary according to the issue and in particular to the way security more broadly is understood. And finally, security is ethical in the sense that different security discourses are built on ethical choices and the practices that they encourage have different ethical implications. So these things matter, these choices matter. The framework through which we view the security implications of issues like climate change matter for the sets of responses that we're likely um, to see. So recognising these three elements of security, security is constructed, political and ethical, um, encourages us then to explore how security is given meaning in different settings to recognise the importance of that meaning that's given to security and engage with that, and to make a case for the way the meaning and practice of security might be shifted in progressive ways. And that's ultimately the sort of theoretical context in which I'm uh, engaging 
with this uh, particular issue. So um, that's the that's the theory in a way. So um, when it comes to climate change uh, itself, this is the sort of work that I've done previously on discourses of climate security when it comes to um, this this work that I published in Political Geography in 2013 um, that maps different discourses of climate security and says, well, actually, underpinning all this, this sense that we have momentum around recognition that climate change constitutes a security issue, this really does belie massive levels of difference in terms of how political communities understand the problem and how different analysts come at it from all the way from those who focus really on the question of how climate change contributes to armed conflict between states all the way through to others who are making a case we should focus on worldly security or um, anthropocene security or at least um, on human security and the welfare of human populations and of course that was something that featured in the 2014 ipcc report so when it comes to climate change, to put it really crudely, some discourses of climate, there are different ways of approaching the problem and some, again, to put it really crudely, are just simply better than others in terms of the practices, in terms of the ethical foundations of those discourses and the sets of practices they subsequently encourage. If our focus is on national security, when thinking about the security implications of climate change, the danger here is that we focus primarily on indirect threats posed by climate change. So not climate change in and of itself, but the way in which it might in turn make armed conflict or large scale population displacement or instability that threatens the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the nation state more likely. In this context, it's more likely to encourage adaptation as a response than mitigation than problems addressing it as at its um, at its core. So this is the sort of argument that's similar to the UN Human Rights Rapporteur, who in 2019 make the case, made the case that we might see something emerging like a climate apartheid, where relatively wealthy and insulated states, at least to some degree, might try to effectively insulate themselves from the manifestations of climate change and effectively throw developed um, developing countries under a bus in the sense of, you know, these are countries that are least responsible for the problem, most immediately vulnerable to the effects of climate change and least able to um, effectively summon resources to uh, address at least material resources. An international security discourse by contrast might focus, might draw attention away from that more narrow focus on the nation state in which the nation state's insulating itself from the effects of what is fundamentally a global problem. So good, we have this shift to the international, but the danger in this context is still that we're focusing largely on indirect threats on the ways in which climate change might contribute to international instability or indeed conflict. And our focus is still on the question of how do we maintain the status quo in terms of the stability of the international um, system. At best, rules and norms of international society might be challenged through the ways in which um, climate change is conceived as a, as a security issue at the international level. But for many, the danger here is that we're trying to preserve a status quo that isn't fit for purpose, that has actually helped create the problem of climate change, whether in terms of the structure of the international economic system or indeed in terms of the state system itself. So an obvious response to these then is human security, where we focus on humans and their um, their access to um, resources to allow them to live meaningful lives. This certainly draws our attention to the particular suffering of those in the developing world, for example. Um, and in that context is a progressive shift but even here, our focus is usually solely on currently living human populations and we don't tend to draw our attention to future generations and other living beings who are in many ways the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. They're least responsible, least able to input into decision making or effective forms of response to that issue and are also most directly affected or compromised by the choices um, and practices that are made in the in the current context. 
So what the book does effectively is start from this, this work that I've done in the past that said, actually, there are these different discourses and they matter. Um, the book tries to push further and say, well, if I make the case that there is this particular discourse that is ecological security, that is more ethically defensible, um, that and that in turn encourages sets of practices that are more effective in responses to, to climate change, then I need to push myself to, to try to make a case for um, what this discourse actually means in practice, um, why it's necessary, what ethical foundations it's built on, and then crucially also engage head on with this question of just how feasible is it to imagine political communities approaching um, security through the lens of ecosystem resilience. So, what constitutes a defensible approach to climate security uh, that encourages appropriate practices to address the problem itself? In this case, I make a case for ecological security, which is fundamentally oriented towards ecosystem resilience, and with it, the rights and needs of the most vulnerable across time, so including future generations across space, so including um, the rights and needs of those marginalised communities in developing countries in particular, and across species, so thinking about obligations to um, other living beings in particular. In terms of the book, um, having outlined the approach to security in theory that I do at the start, this idea of security as um, constructed, as political, as ethical, I then move on in the book to the next chapter, outlining the contours and assumptions of those different discourses of climate security. And then the last three chapters of the, the last three substantive chapters of the book, which is what I'll um, talk about for the few minutes remaining, um, are essentially outlining the key contours of ecological security. So what is it and why it's necessary? Um, what assumptions does it make around whose security matters? What threats to that security are? What it means in practice in terms of the um, means of response to threats to ecological security and the agents capable or indeed responsible for um, advancing ecological security before then in that final chapter getting into that tricky but crucial issue of how we actually get there, how we might identify possibilities for moving towards this particular framework for understanding the security implications of, of climate change. So what is ecological security? In terms of, um, in the first instance, I make a case for a focus on, uh, in this chapter, that first chapter, substantive chapter, makes a case for um, why ecosystems are appropriate as a referent object of security, albeit very complicated uh, and imperfect. Um, what a threat to ecological security actually looks like and what the foundations of that framework are in terms of their ethical um, commitments, for example. So why is it necessary? Here I talk about the, um, the limits of other sets of discourses that I've already uh, identified and the context in particular of the Anthropocene. So this idea that in the current era, when the current geological era that is characterised by the effects of humanity on the Earth system functions itself, we need to recognise interrelationships and the impossibility of closing humanity off from the conditions of our own existence. In this context, I draw on um, second generation ecological pluralist thought, so people like Robin Eckersley, as well as feminist thought in making a case for the importance of conceiving this uh, in terms of interrelationships between different beings and different sets of um, marginalisation or discrimination, if you like. It's acutely challenging to focus on ecosystems in the sense that ecosystems can be anything from really large scale sort of um, planet, semi-planetary regional functions to, to really specific. They are overlapping and interwoven. They're acutely um, different in terms of the scale of vulnerability to temperature rises. All those things make an ecological focus um, challenging or a focus on ecosystems challenging. But I make the case ultimately in the book that if this is the lens through which we attempt to conceptualise and approach the relationship between climate change and security, it's more likely to encourage more progressive sets of practices in response. Um, so threats in this context are not indirect, they are immediate and direct. Uh, they're harms essentially caused by climate change itself. The next chapter goes through questions of means and agents of security. So 
what sets of means would this encourage? What practices? So here, of course, mitigation is absolutely central, preventing the problem itself because the challenge of climate change is viewed as a direct and immediate one. There is a role for adaptation as well, both of human societies and ecosystems themselves. So the IPCC report, when talking about adaptation, spends a bit of time talking about adaptation as applied to ecosystems, not just to human populations. More controversial though, is that I do acknowledge a potential role in this framework for um, geoengineering, you know, even radical forms of intervention that are about minimising harm, at least while we buy time to effectively address the um, implications of climate change. But that's ameliorated by lots of uh, sort of writers that I have about the sets of um, sort of principles that should underpin the discussion of the means of response to the security implications of climate change. So the need, I make a case for the need to focus on dialogue, on humility and reflexivity, uh, principles that should encourage us, that um, should encourage us to talk a lot about the potential um, impacts of the practices we're um, considering to be really humble about what we can claim about ecosystem functionality and how ecosystems work rather than approach this sort of problem through a hubris of how can we sort of um, address these fundamental problems of climate change. And reflexivity in this context refers to a willingness and capacity to step back and think are the practices that we put in place and the policy settings that we have in place effective in terms of addressing this set of problems. In terms of agency, this is primarily in my framework developed into, or I make a case for agency defined um, not by specific sets of actors. So I'm quite jealous when I was writing the book, I'm quite jealous of the elegance of a national security discourse in the sense that you have this relatively, you know, this, uh, this nice neat alignment really between, well, it's the nation state that's threatened it's the nation state that provides security and this immediate sort of uh, um, elision, if you like, of any form of difference between agents and referent object at least makes it nice and neat. Whereas in the ecological security discourse, of course, that becomes far more complicated. In this context, I make a case for defining agency primarily in terms of capacity, drawing on notions of equity and distributive justice, basically say any agent capable of making conscious decisions um, in term, that are consequential in terms of their likely harm have some degree of agency. So there is in this context a role um, for individuals making these types of choices as agents of ecological security, but in the book I really focus on the, the um, structural context in which individuals make those choices. So my focus is largely on states, on the function of um, international sort of economic uh, dynamics through the role of multinational corporations and companies, for example, the private sector, but also intergovernmental organisations and their capacity to effectively manage um, issues of climate change and response to it. Um, so then the final chapter is this really difficult chapter. Um, there's a there's a great uh, article by, um, or indeed a, a book by John Barnett, a good a friend of mine, um, a fellow Australian, who makes a who years ago had this sort of tentative endorsement of ecological security, but finished this discussion by saying, "Well, that's all well and good to think about ecosystems themselves, or to think about the biosphere um, in his case, but um, it's a it's a bystander on the sidelines of a substantive contest over how political communities should engage with this problem." My approach in the book was to say, well, if we think that one particular approach is um, more ethically defensible and likely to encourage sets of responses that are effective um, to climate change, then rather than think, well, that's not relevant because it doesn't fit with institutional arrangements, we should think, let's endorse that and then think about how we can get institutional arrangements and practices to reflect those principles, even just incrementally move towards their endorsement and practices consistent with them. So the final substantive chapter is this chapter around how, to, how we actually get there. Um, can we imagine the, this type of approach focused on the resilience of ecosystems themselves, their capacity to continue to function in some form in the face of the effects of climate change? Can we imagine that finding purchase and genuinely informing practices in response to climate change. And, and here I actually, like I've done in previous work, 
Um, I'm not sure if Eva Neumann is with you, but of course, very familiar with the work of Bourdieu. I use Bourdieu to talk about the ways in which effective forms of agency might be possible, even in structural contexts that don't seem particularly conducive um, to those sets of practices. I talk about imminent possibility in the book and the ways in which there are existing possibilities, including in the endorsement of um, principles that we see consistent potentially with ecological security. So know some interpretations of precaution and the precautionary principle, the imperative for action, even in the face of uncertainty about exactly how ecosystems will function, when tipping points will be, what forms of intervention we should use, for example, common but differentiated responsibility speaks to a lot of the core principles of ecological security, attempts to make a case for how we govern um, geoengineering, including through things like the Oxford principles, arguments about the Anthropocene, eco ecological movements themselves. At all of these levels, it's imperative for us to, to uh, not give up on this discourse, but recognise that there are actually elements of this um, that are extant in existing forms of, of practice in global politics. But at the same time, we do need to step back and recognise the need to identify radical alternatives. And Eva Lovbrand and others have made this case for this, um, for trying to avoid this post-political ontology of the Anthropocene. And basically in concert with others who are talking about planet politics, essentially try to say rather than allow existing institutional frameworks to develop, to determine what we think about the governance of new of the climate crisis we should actually step back and say let's think in creative terms about what we actually need in the book i make a case for both progress and endpoint and basically say that um, even while movements in the direction of recognizing effects to human security might stop short of fundamental obligations or recognition of obligations to other living beings. It's it's a progressive movement and there's something to be embraced in that approach. There's something too to be embraced in um, nation states trying to think of the strategic implications of, of climate change if that ties in to attempts to think about how we transition away from fossil fuel economies, how we address these things uh, fundamentally. So I'm almost out of time in that context. Uh, I've made myself, I think, with this book, a particularly big target in the sense that I'm probably saying things about the theory of security, about climate politics, about ethics, about um, discourse, about all sorts of things that are going to irritate. There's something in there to irritate um, more or less anyone. But ultimately, I think um, the contemporary challenge of climate change really does necessitate thinking in different ways of security if we are linking climate change and security and orienting towards ecosystems and their functionality in the face of this existential threat seems appropriate to me in terms of the ethical principles that that commitment is built upon and the likely ethical implications of practices associated with it. There are massive dilemmas here uh, associated with things like how we move beyond an anthropocentric viewpoint of this particular issue how we deal with the scale of uncertainty and complexity around questions of how ecosystems function, um, that you only need to dabble in sort of debates around geoengineering, for example, to understand there's so much contestation over um, how ecosystems will respond, not just to climate change itself, but of course also to measures that are designed to um, address it. How we go about prioritising threats and responses, how we weigh up the immediate developmental needs of um, currently living human populations against the rights of future generations or other living beings, what the politics of getting there actually looks like, and, and even questions around how applicable this ecological security framework, even in the context of the Anthropocene, how applicable that is beyond this particular example. There's probably a lot more there that is um, contestable or that uh, raise big dilemmas and challenges. Um, there's lots of room for d debate and discussion about it, which is one of the things I liked about this project. But of course, now that I'm on this virtual book tour, it does mean that I'm uh, wide open to lots of different um, criticisms and interventions. But I really would look forward to starting a conversation and having a conversation with you all about that uh, now. But I'll leave it there.
Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Uh, Matt. Um, that was a, a wonderful talk, uh, clear, illuminating. Um, and I just want to add uh, before I take a Q&A that, yes, I think you have made yourself a big target. Um, so one, I've, I've read the book and one of my takeaways was, was the, it's actually a lot, it displays a lot of courage, I think, because Matt, Matt not only obviously is presenting a very radical ethical framework that will, that, that challenges the status quo, but also he challenges the, the conventional wisdom of critical scholars in a number of ways, right? Whether it's going how to conduct a discourse analysis, what discourse analysis is, um, willing to embrace the concept of security, um, embra embracing ecosystem resilience. These are all things that critical scholars, uh, that, that puts Matt on the line, I think. Um, I th I, and I th that's why I loved about the book, that willingness to to put yourself out there and challenge conventional wisdom of all sorts. Um, so I think before we take questions from the audience, I just want to turn to um, Cedric de Conning, um, who is a leader of New Peace Climate Related Peace and Security Risks um, Project um, ongoing at the moment, which seeks to inform um, Norway's work on the UN Security Council. Um, so Cedric, um, do you have a, a question or comment for Matt? Thanks, Paul, and thanks, Matt, and uh, yeah, thanks for your scholarship, first of all. I really appreciate the way you uh, stimulating us all in terms of your thinking, and as as Paul says, I think with quite a courageous uh, attempt to to frame our our discourse. And maybe that's that's the first thing I would like to to ask you to to uh, just summarize to to our audience. Um, that I think we, we all get confused from time to time between, you know, the competing concepts of environmental security. Uh, I know Josh uh, Busby is just coming out with a book very soon now on environmental security. So core differences, how you would see it between environmental security, ecological security, and I think you also said climate, climate security. And then maybe link to that um, from an ecological security perspective um, and having ecosystems as your key reference point and, and ecosystems resilience in a sense is what you want to bring about. What would you think say is, is and how would you describe the key challenges then for both research and practice uh, in terms of what we need to do, let's say differently or what we need to focus on if uh, if we use ecological security as our as our core um, frame of reference? Thanks so much. Uh, I think it's uh, our fault. Okay. As I also said, he, he muted you because there was an echo. But I'm uh, not, uh, panicking. You did give me some crucial time to consider the um, the question, Cedric. Well, thank you so much for that. First of all, I think um, so. The the question, first of all, is the difference between some of these different. You asked a question about the difference between some of these different framing, whether environmental security or ecological security or climate security um, and yes it doesn't in some ways it doesn't help that there are these multiple different terminologies so um, I would see ecological security at least from my perspective functioning as a way of making sense of some of the um, it's a particular intervention on the relationship between climate change and security at least from my perspective um, some of the work that Josh Busby has done is interesting because some of the think tank oriented work he's done focuses really specifically on national security implications, including for the US associated with climate change. Um, more recently, he's focused his work as well on international security. But it's usually about, um, you know, my sense of Josh's work, and I don't know enough about the forthcoming book to, to make this, this claim, but my sense of most of what he's done is how, according to the different ways in which existing political institutions currently think about the security implications of climate change, how should they address that on their threat agenda and or how should they think about particular sets of response that are broadly in their wheelhouse? Um, so where are likely axes of conflict? What should DOD do in terms of preparation? 
Ecological security in that sense is far more radical and says that actually we shouldn't begin, probably not even end with existing political institutions, but think more fundamentally about what it is we're preserving and why. Um, to think in fundamental terms about how we might orient our attention to the rights and needs of the most vulnerable when thinking of security, when thinking of you know, existential threat. And in that context, there's so much um, to address the second question that you raised. There's so much in the um, debates around research and practice and priorities in that space that could um, that suggest themselves that everything from how can we be more certain about ecosystem functionality and tipping points? Because that's still, I mean, even the most recent IPCC report, it can't be definitive on questions of whether, you know, even large scale abrupt climate scenarios like the shutting down of the Atlantic current or the death of the Amazon rainforest, you can't rule those out just because of the scale of complexity around, um, around how those types of dynamics function. So. At one level, that's a priority to understand how those things actually function more effectively and how they'll respond to things like geoengineering interventions or mitigation at certain levels or different adaptation programs, for example. But of course, we can't allow that to stop us from really addressing the, in a radical sense the imperative of immediate action. So. Those are still some of the bigger sort of scientific questions that are in the background, but then how you actually think about pushing states and international organisations towards addressing these challenges themselves. That's again another big, big political issue, but thanks for raising that. Okay, well, I have, I also have uh, some questions for you, well, several questions. The question is which, which ones to, to start with. Um, I think one thing that I thought about when reading your book was time and time change over time. So, I mean, I, in one, this is more of an empirical question, but in your section or your chapter on discourses of international security, you, you tend to identify them, and I, I really like the description of different types and their different implications, but I was wondering if you, doing this discourse analysis, had a sense of change over change over time which, which has there been a movement towards one or another type do we see more of ecological security so you do have element you show how ecological security some elements that are imminent possibilities for this in, in our practices but in a certain sense it was static in a, in a way right we should show that they exist but i i was wondering whether there was a move in this direction already or if there was a move in direction of in, in some other way. So one thing that occurred to me when reading recent UN Security Council comments on environmental security, uh, sorry, on um, climate security was that there seems to be more of a human security aspect to it now. I don't, but I guess you have a greater familiarity with, with this material than I do. So I was wondering if that's your sense or if you could give us another sense of the direction of travel at the moment. Absolutely. Well, in some ways, the, fir the first point to make is that it is dividing according to these different discourses is almost necessarily a, a sort of simplification. There is this heuristic device that you see there in terms of grouping different approaches. And actually, the um, project that, I'm, uh, that I've been just started working on is one that looks at comparative approaches to um, the security implications of climate change between states and actually demonstrate that there's, there's massive levels of distinction between where states locate the response to climate change and security, how they go about prioritising particular sets of responses. So that's one general point that, of course, there's a simplification at the, at the heart of this that does tend to set this sort of framework that if you think in terms of national security, these will be the implications. I think I'd probably make the case that these are tendencies or inclinations that can't necessarily be um, taken to be inevitable, but at the same time um, encourage particular sets of responses. So that's, that's the first point to note. There is this necessarily heuristic device about that type of typology of different um, climate security discourses. I, I have seen 
change over time. I think that's that's pretty clear. And the way in which, you know, the IPCC report in 2014 had a chapter on the human security implications of climate change, that's certainly become um, more of an issue. But I think really uh, a lot of it is this thrust of the Anthropocene context and the, the notion that actually the, the separation between humanity and the ecological conditions of our own existence was always this, there was always this hubris. It was always indefensible in many ways. But um, the arguments around the Anthropocene context do change that. And I think a lot of that has penetrated into the way in which agencies, international organisations, states are beginning to think about the security implications of climate change, where it's not possible for anyone now, especially with some degree of climate change locked in, to wholly insulate ourselves. We, some are going to be better off than others, clearly, and some have more capacity to respond to effects than others. But those types of dynamics absolutely have, I think, shifted um, discursively. Our focus from the old debates around whether there'll be wars over water in the Middle East to, to now, I think in more fundamental terms, how do we how do we think about um, you know the future sustainability of places on Earth for habitation, even uh, non-human habitation? So I think yes, that's an important thing that has changed, is changing, and probably will change. Whether it will encourage the practices that allow us to avoid catastrophe is, of course, another question. <laughs> Yeah, and that brings me to the the my next question related to time. It's kind of double edged. So, do you think we can change fast enough? So, in your book, you present quite a a radical framework, albeit one which has uh, some elements that are already that you can see in our practices, but but very much marginalised or subaltern at the moment. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. in, but you, your goal, you have this radical framework and then your goal is actually to move in the direction of this, right? But it, is that going to be fast enough? That's quite a humble, pra practical goal, but will it be fast enough? And then the other side of that is that if we did implement um, your framework to the full uh, in a thought experiment, um, your, the emphasis on, um, you know, not uh, negating all harm to vulnerable po populations in the future, uh, vulnerable populations now, whether it's not humans or non-humans, might drastically limit the range of activities that we could do to be able to meet uh, the climate crisis, and it might create a different time, time challenge. So I'm wondering how you would mm -hmm. respond to those potential critics. I'm not saying where I stand on those. Uh, no, no, really, really, really good question. Now this, I drew a lot on the um, inspiration, so I draw a lot on Robin Eckersley's work generally, but um, her work with Brian Barry and others on the Green State, I've, I found quite inspiring because there is this sense we have this broader project that we want to, to put in to achieve. We have a conception of an endpoint in terms of what types of practices we'd like to see, but to write off um, the institutional capacity of the state to actually get us there would be self-defeating. We need to conceive of ways to mobilise existing sets of institutions and practices to be better, even if they're not perfect. We need to push them in that direction. So it's less, I think, than that will be wholly effective and more just we have to start moving in this direction and we need to we need to make those movements urgently but you know we need to work with the capacity that we have in place now so where that gets yeah where that does get tricky is we ha have this emergency now and will we see something like i'm writing a, a book chapter at the moment with simon dolby who insisted as part of this that i had to read this fiction book uh, by kim stanley robinson the minister <laughs> For the future, I'm not sure many people are familiar with it, but it imagines this situation in 20 years time where you've got states unilaterally deploying geoengineering. You've got this overarching sort of ministry that sits almost above the UN Security Council that is essentially deciding, you know, how um, currency exchange look, how all these different rules take place. So that's been in my mind when I've been thinking about the, the alternatives to working with existing institutions. Are we looking at something fundamentally that could potentially cause more harm or damage than others? I, I'm sort of torn. I'm always 
hopeful, but I wouldn't necessarily say I'm optimistic in terms of the capacity to avoid harm. I think in part because now we're talk we're already now talking about harm minimization in the context of climate change. We're not talking about harm avoidance and it's just really how seriously can we take it? There are positive signs, I think, in term in the lead up to, to COP. Hopefully that'll be sustained through that meeting and afterwards around um, the types of imperatives for change, because a lot of the principles being endorsed are, are broadly similar or at least progressive from where we are now. So a long, a wide ranging response really that says uh, we can hope that some of these things will happen. I think realistically we have to keep an eye on how we work in the present with contemporary distributions of power and contemporary powerful institutions, even with an eye on the type of radical change that we might need. Thank you. I mean, that wide ranging question actually preempted my next question, which was about uh, who is the most likely agents of change. Um, and uh, but uh, before I go ask any more questions, I have a one from the audience member, from an audience member, um, my colleague at NUPI, um, Lucas Pais. Um, so he writes, thank you for the great presentation. I very much look forward to reading the book. It sounds fantastic. So you have a fan here. Um, <laughs> my question, uh, his question is about the scales of ecological security. Could you please elaborate on the implications of delimiting specific ecosystems as referring objects for security, given the interconnected and overlapping nature of ecosystems? Um, for finding institutional solutions and defining arenas of governance. So, this, so Lucas's question, to give you a bit of context to it, comes from an ongoing project funded by the European Research Council that I'm also part of, which is the LORAX project, Understanding Ecosystem Politics, which studies empirically like the, the political and social side effects of um, ecosystem cooperation that cuts across transnational boundaries. So that's where Lucas is coming from. And that project mm -hmm. was led by Alana Wilson-Rowe, who is also watching. Wow. Uh, thank you, Lucas. That's a, obviously a really tricky one. And I mean, without wanting, because that's complicated enough, but of course, the, another question that is, is relatively apparent when you're talking about ecosystems is, is what do you do about ecosystems that are changing in terms of their functionality, in terms of what they what they do and which different species now they're sustaining rather than others. And that's an additional level of uh, challenge. Um, in a way, my, my answer, and it probably sounds like I'm cheating in my answer to this, but a, my answer in the book is to define a focus on ecosystem resilience brought primarily in terms of um, a, it being a sensibility through which we approach the issue of climate change and its likely effects. So rather than be specific necessarily in an abstract sense about exactly um, how we go about prioritising one ecosystem over another when there are difficult choices to be made, that the, the broad argument that I'm making in the book is that if our focus is on sustaining the functionality of existing forms of ecosystems, which as you know are overlapping, do have um, multiple different functions, do sustain multiple different species. If that is still uh, the primary lens through which we view this issue, then that will encourage sets of practices that are more likely to be um, progressive. In this context, I'm actually drawing it sounds really strange, but I feel like um, the way in which the nation works, national security is in some ways broadly similar. That at when we think about the nation, it's really the means rather than the ends. It's not the nation state has never been the answer for to the question of whose security matters in the sense that the whole thing is built on the social contract on the social contract and the idea that states exist to provide for the well-being of their populations. Now, what does that mean? That's a really open question. And national security discourses have sort of done well to answer that or fold it off by saying it's the nation's fact. But we all know the second we interrogate that, then it raises more questions than it answers. I'm not saying, I think ecological security does the same. It raises a lot of really complicated questions around what um, our practices should be and what our ethics should be in that context. But if broadly speaking, it's focused, focus, 
then it's likely to encourage more progressive responses. So I'm sorry, I don't think I had an answered that as directly as Lucas was uh, was hoping, but that's a, as far as well. No, I I actually think that makes a lot that makes a lot of sense. I don't think that was a dodge at all. Um, I think we're running out of time, um, but I think I want to ask well, on that agents of change question. I was this is maybe beyond the remit of your book, but maybe I can ask you to speculate. Do you what role do you see for electoral politics? So we see do you see um, political parties being potential agents of uh, an ecological security approach. Um, I know I know empirically you probably haven't been able to, this is beyond, but from your you know know-how and thinking about this and engaging with people, do, do you see it that as one prospect? Because I think that agents of change is, is a big problem for all critical theories, um, particularly in the um, situation we contemporary context. Um, so I wonder if, I guess, briefly. <laughs> so, so uh, Frank, Frank, his work where he basically says, look, um, we can't expect nation states to only decide of their own volition that actually the, the change needs to be made. In the same way, we arguably can't make that same assumption about um, private companies. So I go into a little bit of detail about this and basically say, Practices change when we reach a critical mass and when there's enough people who basically say, well, actually, we are shifting away from that use of fossil fuels in ways that forces the hand of um, private companies. I think the same would happen with states in instances where there is a sense that the constituency, where there's a loss of legitimacy through a failure to address a problem like climate change fundamentally, and we're getting to that already with some states given just how important this issue is for their communities then political parties have a massive role to play now I, my own experience my own country of australia is probably the worst in terms of thinking of how the party politics of climate change have played out over time um, where it's become this toxic issue and it's the opposite of the sort of bipartisanship you'd like to see in different contexts or even conservatives leading the way as we've seen in some contexts, whether it's you know Germany or the UK, for example, but um, but yes, political parties, any form of pressure on states to shift ground, any sense that they no longer speak on behalf of the constituency they claim to, which is really what legitimacy is about, um, can be really important and politically consequential. I think. Yeah, I agree, and I think that is an excellent. Um Wait, uh, comment to end upon. Um, so let me just take this opportunity to thank you again for speaking to us today um, and, um, and also having patience while we figured out the technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> and for everyone listening at home, you can, I, I think you can buy the book now online. Uh, uh, it, it's a, a little bit pricey, I must admit. Um, so, if, um, so, so maybe pester your library into buying one. Um, if you, if you like, if you think it's a bit too much for you. Um, okay, Matt, um, thank you. And I, I give you another presentation in, in three hours time. And so <laughs> late in the evening, uh, you'll be talking to Scandinavians, I understand. Um, so I won't keep more, any more of your time. Um, th thanks again. And thank you everybody for tuning in. Cheerio. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.